in the studio today with my good friend and co-producer of the Watchers series, Richard Shaw. Um, but we're going to talk about Richard's independent film called Torah Codes, End to Darkness. And it's a fantastic film. I have seen it several times, uh, packed with information. But my first question, and thanks for being here, by the way. <laughs> Sorry my, I'm not all dressed up. I was getting ready to do a shoot today on the beach exactly so and I'm just in a sweatshirt and i last suit him in and here he is folks yeah. so uh sorry the for the sweatshirt but <laughs> content is more important than how you look but uh but here's the deal you you created this film and it's an amazing piece of work and it, and it really plums the depth of the torah codes but i want let's get the backstory what motivated you to do the film well i read the book uh about the Bible codes back in 98 that, that uh, Michael Drossen had written. Mm -hmm. And I was amazed by it. And then I saw a couple documentaries done in, in uh, later years by various companies, but they always had used the tables that Michael Drossen had come up with from his book. So I was thinking, well, why doesn't someone go to Israel and actually talk to these guys and see what they're working on and what interests them? And so I, I got to know Professor Rips pretty well and Rabbi Glazerson. And through the years, uh, they were introduced to me by Professor Robert Harrelick from City University in New York, who's a brilliant scientist. Yeah, he's, own, he's amazing. Own, right? Yeah, he's a great guy. And so we kind of started a relationship, and I was collaborating with them and asking them questions, and they found that some of my questions intrigued them, and they would go to work on those questions, which shocked me. I had no idea they'd when you, do that. When you, when you say go to work, what do you mean by that? Well, uh, when I first met uh, Rabbi Gladison and, and Professor Rips, it was in Beverly Hills at a Jewish center there, and I said, so what do you guys think about the upcoming 2012? Now, this was in 2006 when I asked them. Wow, that. okay. And Ten years ago. they looked at each other, what is 2012? I mean, they didn't <laughs> know what it was, which was really kind of, kind of funny. Because I would have thought they'd be really into that. Well, I said, you know, the Mayan calendar, the end of the world, you know, all those kind of things. Well, they didn't know. So I, I discovered that if they didn't know the answer to something, then they, that became their mission in life, <laughs> which was really amazing to me. So about a week and a half later, I get this call from Jerusalem, and it was Rabbi Glazerson. He said, this is, was a brilliant idea you had, and we've done a lot of tables, and they were getting all kinds of information about 2012. And, and so we learned a lot through that process, and we got to know each other, and I took a trip to New York to hang out with them for a couple days. And, and then finally, um, in, at the end of... Uh, uh, 2014, I was able to go to Israel and actually do shoot the film. And by the time the first part of 2015 rolled around, it was edited and, and it ready for distribution. And it's basically the story of what the codes are, how they came about, who Professor Rips is, uh, what Rabbi Glazerson has found, and how those codes seem to be showing us things that are happening in our time even our very names are encoded in the Torah codes. Mm -hmm. And the more I study it, um, the more I see that there's other numbers that are embedded in the Torah that defy any explanation. Let, let's go back to Torah codes 101. For those folks who aren't sure about the Torah codes, and this sounds like something really weird, and is it biblical or is it not biblical? You know, we have, we have things like in, in Scripture, um, like, like the, uh, the Umen and the Thummim, which are no longer in use. And that's weird. When the, breast, the high priest would wear the breastplate and the stones would light up, and they would ask questions and the stones would light up. I mean, that's like right out of science fiction, and yet it's in our Bibles. Yeah. Tell us about um, the early days of the, I mean, the real, let's go back like 50, 60 years after World War II, when one particular rabbi, Weissmandel, is working with Torah codes with the little three by five index cards. This is well before the, the age of computers. And what he's finding is absolutely astounding. And I remember you told me this, and I just, I was blown away by this. Share that with us, please. Well, he had always felt that there was something about the Torah that it must be encoded. But this guy was really brilliant. Okay, Weissman Dell was a world-class mathematician. And the 3 by 5 index card story was when he was a teenager, he was doing that. He would write down the words from the Torah in 
in like 10 by 10 grids with characters in there and then look at them, spread them out on the table and look at it, looking for patterns, like like someone who's cracking a code. Amazing. Do, yeah, know? amazing. And then World War II happened and he was diverted from working on the Torah codes, but and a lot of his family was killed in Auschwitz during World War II. So he ended up in New York after the war, a broken man, but decided to pick up where he left up on the Torah codes. So the university there gave him some interns to help him with this, and he discovered things just by counting with his finger that were repeatable. I mean, it's an arduous task. I mean, it's like, but he discovered like if he went into the Book of Genesis and and started counting at the first letter Tet for Torah, and skipped every 50 letters, it said Torah. And he goes, hmm, well, that's interesting. Maybe that's just a fluke. So then he tried it in the book of Exodus, and it worked again. Second book of the Bible, yeah. right? So it's like, whoa, now it's happened twice. So maybe it's in the book of in Leviticus. Well, it didn't work that way in Leviticus. So he thought, well, let's try the number eight, which is the in the Jewish mind, the number eight is the union of God and man. It's the little circles that... Mm -hmm. And he did that, and he found the word Hashem, which is the Jewish name for the God with no name. Mm -hmm. Every, uh, uh, I guess it was every eight letters. So then after that, he he decided to go back and see if the word Torah would show up. And it, it showed up in the books of Numbers and in Deuteronomy, every 50 letters. Except in the Deuteronomy, it, it, it came up every 49 letters, not 50, because wow. Deuteronomy was the book that Moses wrote. So he doesn't get the 50 <laughs> number, the perfect number of God. So you end up with basically where it says Torah, Torah, God, Torah, Torah. And what I didn't tell you is that the last two books, uh, uh, Deuteronomy, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, in Deuteronomy. So Numbers in Deuteronomy had the word Torah, but spelled backwards. Mm. So basically, it was everything's a graphic. pointing. Yeah, everything's pointing to God wow. in the center. I mean, and that's just by counting with his finger. So the whole process kind of uh, was put on hold for a good 20 years until computers were invented. And so Professor Rips had seen a demonstration by another rabbi that he knew who gave him Weissmandel's book. And he became interested in it and felt like, well, we could write a program to do the searching for us. And back then, in those days, all there was was an Apple II computer. Amazing. There was no Hebrew font. There was nothing. So they gave every Hebrew letter a number and put all those numbers into the computer. So the computer was dealing with what it knew best, numbers. And there wasn't even enough RAM in those days to do the whole Torah. So they did like... I don't know, the first half of the book of Genesis. But even doing it that way, they discovered all sorts of stuff, and, and then they were shocked. So as computers got better and better, now it's pretty much like it is today, where you have pretty much what looks like a crossword puzzle, where we have words vertically and, and horizontally and that type of thing. That's like what we have today. So I just want to say something that, you know, that you don't look at the Torah codes as, as something above Scripture. I mean, Scripture is the, just the plain text is the plain text. But what we find interesting is there seems to be a code within the Torah, which means that um, that there's, there's multiple codes, multiple codes. Right. Yeah. Um, multiple codes. and you know, in, until the modern era, we couldn't do this. I mean, it was so. It, I find it just fascinating because of computers. We now can kind of go in and not see the mind of Hashem, the mind of God, but we get a little idea of his signature, of his fingerprint, of just another glance of what he's about. So tell us. You know, you mentioned in the beginning about the 2012 end of the world Mayan calendar, and I've written about that extensively too, sure. and and just said, you know, it's, it's a, why does the Mayan calendar usurp biblical authority? I mean, it shouldn't. And you had a little uh, from the Torah codes. You had something, um, a, a table that talked about the codes and and reveal that to us now. I found well, I found that really interesting. They they did all these tables that said uh, 2012. Uh, which was in the Hebrew calendar was 5772, mm -hmm. 2012. And then it would say end of the world, uh, and, and all of these other things appeared in that. But then we realized that, that the Torah codes sometimes emulate what people are talking about, what's popular uh, at the time, you know, uh, during that year. And everybody was talking about it was everywhere. 2012, yeah, this end is of the it. world. Sure. 
So it came up in numerous tables. I mean, when in, in very significant tables too, where the you know the words were parallel to each other and they were small skips and all that kind of thing. But uh, then Glazerson did a table that I thought was really interesting, where it says uh, 5772 December 22nd, 2012. Now remember the the end 21st, the day of doom sure. was December 21st. His table said, change in the world, <laughs> December 22nd, 2012. That table, to me, appears to be true. Because if you look back over the past four years now, the world has gone, has plummeted in so many ways. I mean, that it's hard it's to It's become explain. chaotic. Yeah. Yeah. And really, since that, that date, I mean, things were sort of glued together still, but now things are really coming apart quickly. There was a table, uh, one of my favorites that you showed me, I remember, which is just astounding. Um, and, and, you know, this gets complicated because we talk about the Torah code table over the plain text. But it had to do with the events of 9-11. Tell us about that. Well, there, there are tables on 9-11 that are really profound. I mean, a, a long time ago, Professor Ripps, just to make a point, he had a, back in those days, had a tractor feed computer, you know, printer. And so he basically printed out the entire book of numbers looking for the 9-11 scenario, you know, airplane, terrorist, attack, the, basically the keywords that were in all of the world newspapers. And the whole thing is blank until you get down to chapter 20 of the book of numbers, and then all of those words were clustered together in one chapter. Like, here we are, it's right here, this was intentional, you're supposed to see this. Mm. That kind of stuff, I find amazing. It is amazing, absolutely. And so, I asked Professor Harrell, like I said, can we do, like, check with some monkey text, you know, just random Hebrew text? Hey, tell, tell, explain what a monkey text is. A monkey text could be either, like, a non-encoded text, like Moby Dick, Moby Dick or, sure. or something like that. Or, or it could be a text that's artificially created, where you take the Torah, and you run it through the computer and you tell it to scramble all the letters. And you use that as a test, as a, a scientific backup test to mm -hmm. see what happens. So so we did that, and we came up with tables that had all those key words, but Professor Ripp's table, the total number of characters in the entire table about 9-11 was 234 characters, which is like nothing. Tiny. Very small. Very small. The, the, yeah. area. the ones that were basically random text came up like one of them was uh, 7,700 and some. No, and you can get anything out of that, yeah. sure. The other one was like 4,300 characters. So it was a, a, a proven fact that basically the Torah is well ordered and these other texts are just totally random. And yeah, you'll find words in them because you have a powerful enough computer it will basically generate those words for you. Wow. And it, under the plain text, so it, it, you know, it showed those all those words, 9-11, uh, terror, plain... And on the plain text, it talked about the three, tell us about that, the 3,000. What he's saying, plain text, he means the just the normal text you'd read when right. you open the Torah mm -hmm. and read it. Mm -hmm. uh, in this particular instance, it would be in Hebrew. But uh, what happens sometimes, and we have no explanation for it, is we'll look for a set of key words in the Torah, and under those in the plain text will be something that refers to what we've to just what you're asked doing. for. So they, uh, Rabbi Glazerson and Professor Rips did a table that said uh, uh, terror, 9-11, airplane attack, Ishmael, meaning it was Arabs mm -hmm. were involved, mm -hmm. that kind of thing. And down in the plain text, it said, and fell that day about 3,000 men. That's amazing. Now, that's pretty weird. Yeah, that's amazing. the number of people that died was something like, I don't know, 2,900, yeah, just people. Just under 3,000, yeah. right? Yeah. And... So, I mean, that was in the plain text, which means that all this has been encoded like 3,328 years ago this year, I believe is the correct number. The Torah was given in the Hebrew calendar was given in 2448. So if you do the math, you can figure out how many years the Torah has been out. There. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Now, this again, this doesn't usurp scripture and it certainly doesn't usurp. The, prophet, the biblical prophetic narrative. But what we do find interesting is that here we are in the modern age and we can run computers and we can sort of see the fingerprints of God, which shouldn't be there. Now, is there any other book, to your knowledge, on the planet that has that? There's, there's, a, there's a, um, a debunker, 
a skeptic, and I won't mention the man's name, uh, but, you know, he looks at all this stuff and insists that all this is just random and you can get Moby Dick and get exactly the same, um, you know, the same type of, of well, table like what we just described yeah. where you, you know you use a random text and yeah you can find those names but but what what's the skip of those once you get yeah. them like every three thousand letters or something yeah, I mean, insignificant at that sometimes point. you'll get big skips but if they all jive if they're all in parallel and they're all related then sometimes you can overlook <laughs> that it may not necessarily mean it's not significant if you have all these other words that are connected to them but in the case of this particular gentleman we don't know what his skips were. We don't know his methodology for getting, and he was essentially forcing these tables into existence using monkey text, you know, using a computer and just showing what he wanted you to see. Yeah. So that's really not fair. It's not fair. No, yeah. I agree. It's kind of like cheating. Some, some of the Torah codes are talking about the coming of Messiah. Now, that's not necessarily in the film. You sort of hint at it, but you've done other, you know, updates on YouTube talking about uh, the coming of Messiah in 2016. If people go to our website, endtodarkness.com. There's a couple of those up there for free. You can just watch them. Absolutely. What I think is interesting about this, I, I never was into gematria. I never was into numerology. Explain what gematria is. Gematria is the science of numbers. Every Hebrew character has a number. And so, you know, there would be, there's instances in scripture where it talks about, you know, the number of a man and this kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And it's basically, if you add up the letters you get a number a specific one well let me stop you just real quick folks just to just to solidify this from a biblical perspective his number is 666 that's the antichrist that's gematria so that's right exactly now we don't know where that number is derived from mm -hmm. but it's like a clue the bible's full of clues mm -hmm. and the torah is unique i mean there's i've, I've asked the rabbis and professors have you tried getting results in other books other than the torah and they have, but they don't get the same kind of results. These other books are not encoded the same way. You might get isolated words in other books, uh, like um, uh, in the book of Ezekiel. You remember that in the 38th chapter, the word mm -hmm. Obama comes up. Yeah, that's bizarre. That's very strange. comes up every seven letters. And the, the number seven, as you know, is very significant in Scripture. So we don't know what that means if Obama's involved in that. Situation God may or, God war you're talking about yeah, Ezekiel 38 war right or if it's time stamping so that we know at this particular time when Obama's around this will happen we don't we don't know, know. we don't know what that is interestingly in the press they're saying that Obama's going for the head of the UN yeah, yeah. which is like that's kind of like uh, that's very interesting isn't it yeah yeah, hmm. yeah. so maybe he's involved we don't know but I thought that was interesting but we don't get uh, these collections of Torah code tables in other books like we do in the Torah. Now there are people that are doing that and getting hundreds of thousands of hits on YouTube and I beg to differ with how they're doing it because you can't use the King James Bible to look up Torah codes. It's just like a complete idiotic thing to do because you have to use the original Hebrew, Hebrew font. And this is where this is where um, Rabbi Glazer's sin is really comes into play on this, right? He's I mean, fantastic at yeah. it, you know. Now, he's an Orthodox rabbi, so he doesn't believe in the same way that I do, but right. yet it doesn't mean that I discount his research mm -hmm. because I think his research is really important. Mm -hmm. And plus, I think Glazerson is a very gifted individual. And I've seen evidence of some of these rabbis who have God's anointing, for other lack of a better expression, to do what they're doing. I believe that they're supposed to be doing this. And Glazerson comes up with stuff. And now some of the other rabbis might say, well, it's not significant. We don't know what the p-value of this table. He's just... What, what is p-value? P-value is probability. They okay. usually run a probability test. They'll run it against a million other texts to see how... And because of the computers, we can do that. We Go back that, 50 yeah. years and there's no way to do no, that. No, now we can do that. Yeah, that's before. incredible. It would take days to do mm -hmm. it. Now it's like a few minutes you can do it. But... The proof is in the pudding. Like, uh, Lazerson found a table. He was curious about the election of Netanyahu last year in March. So in February, he looks up BB Netanyahu, uh, looks up the phrase, will be elected in 5775, which was 2015. And, and all those words came up in a table, and it even said on March 17th. Wow. So, I mean, I knew that that table existed. And then... We were hearing the mainstream media, I'm sure you remember this, they were all saying, 
Um, it's going to be a close election. It's a close election. A careful. Have a chance. Right. But, you know, right. the other uh, party may win instead of Likud party. It may be someone of the other, maybe someone else, and it didn't happen. And so he won by a landslide. And then this table that Glazerson had done over a month and a half before, roughly, was totally correct in every respect. And you saw that yeah. well in advance of the election. Yeah, it's up on my website. Going back to Moses um, and the Torah, how did Moses receive the Torah? That's something that we don't exactly know. We don't know the process involved, whether you know God dictated it to him and he sat there and wrote it all down, or if the angels did it. Uh, there's, there's a kind of a clue uh, in the New Testament, the book of Acts, where Stephen's being stoned mm -hmm. and he's talking to the scribes and Pharisees, the ones that are there stoning him, and Paul is standing nearby and listening to all this. And Stephen's saying, well, you know, you haven't followed the Torah that was given to you by angels, he said. So this was 2,000 years ago, and we've some of that knowledge, inside insider information, has been lost through the, through the years. But we, we really don't know, except it makes sense to me that God used uh, assistance to do stuff for him, and doing the Torah for Moses may have been part of that. Mm -hmm. um, it's very mysterious. It's the no, it is written it's, like that. Yeah, I, I, I agree. And folks, we're not we're not saying that you know ET did it or God has not. Please don't misunderstand us. We believe that this is the inerrant word of God, the Torah given to Moses. All we're saying is like. How did he get it? I mean, was it how how did it how did he transport it off off the mountain? Um, and he's gone for forty days. But was it really was it really forty days, or was it just let's say by did, did Moses from Moses' perspective was it more like two or three days? I mean, we see we get into this whole. Let me just let me just before I let you have it, let me just say one thing here. When Yeshua, when Jesus is taken up, he's being tempted, and the fallen one takes Jesus up, and in a moment of time shows him all the kingdoms of the world. I believe that that's literal. Yeah, I do. well, that's like a near-death experience. Same thing. People say that they saw their whole life in a split Just a second. flash. Yeah. And there is that idea that in heaven, time is not literal. Time and space, as we know, it is not the same out of this dimension. That That's what right. we're saying here. In the supernatural dimension. It seems to be that when you're in the presence of those kind of beings, that's kind of what happens. Which would make sense that Moses was really upset over the fact that when he gets back and they're making the golden calf and all that, and he shatters the tables and all that. Because maybe, I mean, this is a theory, but it is intriguing. It would ex answer some questions that it didn't seem that long to him. And he goes, how could they get screwed up this quickly? Yeah, in a couple of days. Yeah. Wait a minute. Right. <laughs> you know, doesn't it? Yeah. I mean, it just yeah. seems like common sense, like if you think. But we don't know. But um, then there was this Jewish boy I sent you a linked to right. that had a near-death experience. And this is in 2016. This is just fairly recently. Yeah, and he talked about that idea that time was nonlinear and, and that he was shown all of these things. And he also talked about Hashem coming, the Messiah coming, coming right. this year. Coming very soon. Coming very soon. Now, this is what uh, that particular topic uh, in 5776 comes up in Gematria, uh, this, this idea of looking for numbers. Uh, comes up constantly now. 1820 is like the secret number for God, and you get that number by multiplying the Hebrew number for the word God with uh, the number uh, 70, which is the word secret, and its its gematria is 70. You, add the, you multiply those and you get 1820. Well, you find all these things, these references for 1820 in the, in the Torah that are beyond anything that you could possibly design a book today if you were going to do it. I mean, like there was 1,820 characters that that cap the creation story. There's mm -hmm. that many characters. Mm -hmm. From the sentences from the first uh, 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 chapter of Genesis to around the 11th or 12th chapter of Exodus where the first laws were given is 1,820 sentences. That's amazing. Yeah. The words that Jacob, Leah, and Rachel uttered added up to 1,820 words. I mean, stuff like that is like, come on now, give me a break. That's more than just coincidence. There's a code. So now, Glazerson does a Torah code table using the skip of 1,820 characters, and it gets Return of Mashiach. Return of Mashiach. Well, it says Mashiach, 
it says Elijah, it says uh, 776, which is this year, uh -huh. and all these words come up uh, with a skip of 1820, and they're all clustered together in parallel rows. Now, that I don't understand. I've never seen a table like that ever before. It kind of gives me chills, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. because you can't make this stuff up. That's really weird. Wow. Rick, unfortunately, we are basically out of time. But, folks, this is an incredible subject. And, again, I just, I just want to state and, and, and close with this, that we're not saying that the Torah codes you know, should take the place of the Bible. All we're saying is because of the age that we live in, we're able to go in and we can see the fingerprints of, of our Savior. We can see the fingerprints of God all over this, which is another indication that this book is of supernatural origin, and that's the God we serve. Folks, thanks so much for watching Politics, Prophecy, and the Supernatural Report. And Rick, thanks for coming on Great the record. Thanks Appreciate so it.